Hey everybody, welcome to another episode of Brain Scratch for today, June 2nd, 2017. Thank you so much for joining me. I am your host, John Lorden. And you know, many times I'll get um, suggestions from you about cases that are close to where you guys live. I thought for today's episode, why don't we cover a case that uh, happened when I used to live close to it back when I was in California. So today we're talking about the case of Mitrice Richardson. Uh, and before I get started on this, I have to give a big thank you to Heather Woodward, who contributed some research to this, sent me a bunch of great bullet points to talk about. Thank you so much for the help on this case, Heather. Um, it's a case I'm familiar with because I did track it when it was going on. Um, it's before I was doing this type of work, so I certainly didn't track it as intently as you know I do nowadays when I'm especially when I'm researching something to present to you guys. Um, and I certainly learned some things about this case after looking through it again. So um, with all that being said, let's get started on this case. Matrice Richardson was a 24-year-old American woman uh, who went missing on September 17th, 2009 after being released from a Calabasas, California jail where she had been taken after behaving erratically at a restaurant. So get this, uh, she was released from a jail. It's actually a sheriff's station um, that is, it used to be right across the street from my main supermarket. She's released in the middle of the night. She walks down to what's known as Las Virginis Road. If she would have made a left to Las Virginis, uh, within a mile and a half, she would have been square in the middle of my neighborhood. Unfortunately, my trees went right. And even though to the right, you will hit Malibu and amazing beaches and amazing restaurants, um, that path to get there is extremely treacherous. It is known as Malibu Canyon. Uh, it's a very windy road. Chances are you've probably seen it featured in a car commercial before. It's very recognizable, especially for people that used to, I, I actually had a commute where I was driving on that canyon every single day for a long time. Um, but it's extremely windy. There's no walking path, and it's really not well lit, particularly in the middle of the night. And now we have a 24-year-old girl that's just been released from a sheriff substation, and uh, she's expected, I guess, to go back that direction because her car is impounded back in Malibu. And that's where she was picked up before she was brought to this sheriff station approximately 13 miles away. Uh, just for uh, just to get a little more background on my trees, Richardson was a graduate of South Hills High School in West Covina, California. Quick little um, footnote there. I was actually born in West Covina, California. She graduated from Cal State University Fullerton with a Bachelor of Arts degree in psychology in 2008. So now let's talk a little bit about what was going on and what led up to her arrest. Um, I'm going to jump over to an article at the LAist.com. This is an article that um, they've put together because a documentary was produced about this case. I'll be telling you more about that as we go as well. She was behaving strangely the night she disappeared and in the days leading up to it, leaving strange messages for family members on social media. She took off after lunch from her job at the freight company and wound up at Joffrey's, an expensive restaurant in Malibu later that day. The valet attendant, staff, and other diners reported that she was behaving in a bizarre manner. And I'm going to stop it there because I want to slow this down a little bit. Okay, so first of all, why was she in Malibu? Apparently, she had been telling some family members she was thinking of going to grad school at Pepperdine. And Pepperdine is located right at the corner of Malibu Canyon um, and the Pacific Coast Highway. It's an extremely impressive site if you've ever seen it. It's got this big sprawling lawn leading up to a giant cross. Um, I don't know if she actually had an appointment there that day or if she just wanted to drive by to take a look at it. Uh, she was actually from, from what I understand, she was in South Los Angeles living with her grandmother. So this is like 40, maybe 45 miles away from her home. So I would assume she had some reason to want to drive out there. Joffrey's is actually further north from uh, the Pepperdine campus. So she drove by Pepperdine and wound up at this Joffrey's restaurant. Now, it's interesting they mentioned the valet attendant. Um, apparently, she was getting her car valeted, and while he was going and parking her car, she jumped into 
a car that wasn't hers, which turned out to be the valet's car. I think possibly he had it nearby with the door open because he would sit in there as he was waiting for cars to come up for him to valet. Uh, he got in the car with her, was wondering what she was doing. She was going through her CDs and she said that she was um, trying to avenge Michael Jackson's death. So at this point, he already knew something really wrong was going on. He kind of ushers her into the restaurant and gives the people that are working in the restaurant a little bit of a heads up that they might be dealing with someone that is having some type of problem. So um, just to give you a little bit of backstory around her appearance there, um, there's some stuff that's, that's already going on here that is somewhat questionable. On top of her job at the freight company, she also works as a go-go dancer. And Heather is sure to po point out, not a stripper, a legit go-go dancer at a lesbian club. And if you look into my Teresa's background, you're going to see that dance is a very important part of her life. There's a lot of footage of her doing competitions and stuff as she's younger, not particularly for hip hop dancing. The footage that I saw looked uh, more classical and maybe for, you know, stage plays or something like that. But apparently she did wind up winning a competition for hip hop dancing as well. Um, but let's continue here. So. Uh, they say that she was behaving in a bizarre manner, saying strange things to them about astrology, Michael Jackson's death, and messages from God, who supposedly told her to take the day off. She also racked up a $98 tab. I think I've seen that number change around a bit, but it's around there. I think it's $89, actually. Uh, but it was a tab that she couldn't pay. She pulled out a joint while talking to the manager about settling her bill. The restaurant called the cops, telling them they had a customer who couldn't pay her bill and who was possibly on drugs. The strange thing about her not being able to pay her bill is she had a few thousand dollars in her uh, bank account. So uh, I don't know what's going on here. In later information, we're going to find that they do find her purse. Her purse is in her car uh, with her cell phone, which is also in her car. I don't know if she possibly did not have an ATM card with her or something along those lines. But for some reason, from her perspective, she could not pay the bill. Though employees were contemplating paying her bill, the manager said he decided to press charges because he felt like she wasn't safe to drive a car or be by herself based on her behavior. Um, and I've seen a lot of information kick around about this. Um, I've seen that the sheriffs actually told the manager that he would have to say he was conducting a citizen's arrest in order to make sure that they could arrest her and process her further. Um, that's why the employees, they were just considering chipping in and just covering the bill for her. Um, people said that she was actually, outside of the, the strange things she was talking about, that she seemed very pleasant. She had um, started talking to a big group at a neighboring table. The people that were working were checking in with that group and saying, you know, are you okay with her? Do we need to do something? And the people were fine uh, with her trying to essentially join their party. So just a, a bit of strange conditions around the types of things she was saying and then obviously trying to leave without paying the tab. So Richardson was taken to jail to the Lost Hills station in a remote part of a Agora. Um, it's actually on Agora Hills Road. I don't know if it's really Agora at that point or still in Calabasas, but it's not that remote. It's literally across the street from a giant Albertson's, Albertson's shopping center. There's a Starbucks. There's a Jack in the Box. There's a McDonald's, and within half a mile is the 101 freeway. Um, I was just living on the other side of the freeway. There's plen plenty of people around there. So um, it's strange because as I look more into this case, there seems to be this assumption that th this is kind of like some section of California that is just so vast and open and there's nothing really around. Compared to, for example, downtown LA or something like that, yeah, there's certainly a lot of space out there. There's a couple of state parks out there. It butts up kind of against the Santa Monica Mountains. You have the tail end of Mulholland Drive kind of coming through over there. Um, but even if you look at a satellite view of all that, there's still big sections of neighborhoods that are going on around all those hills, basically wherever it's possible, because that real estate is so wicked expensive. Uh, you have a lot of celebrities that live out there. Uh, Will and Jada Smith's home is out there. Um, as I think also a school that they had run for a little bit is in that area as well. So it's not quite as desolate as some of these articles want to make it out to be. And certainly, 
if she did walk, as I'm assuming she did, to the Lost Virginess road and look left or look right, if she would have looked left, she would have seen a McDonald's, a supermarket, all kinds of lights in the neighborhood. And if she looked right, she probably didn't see much except a windy road into darkness. So it's very curious that it seems like she took the right turn, uh, except for the fact that her car was back over there. So uh, let's continue here. A search of her car turned up her driver's license, but authorities didn't report finding her wallet, cell phone, or any money. Police impounded the car. Uh, other reports I've seen said that they find her money, her purse, in the car with her cell phone later, basically after she goes missing. So I'm not sure how they missed that initially. Um, what they're not mentioning here that they do find in her car is a bag of marijuana, um, two bottles of alcohol, and I think a half a case of beer, but all those are closed. It's, it doesn't look like she's been driving drunk or anything like that. Um, so just worth noting that's what was in her car. Sutton said deputies indicated her daughter would be held overnight. So essentially, um, she gets to the police station and she's allowed her phone call. It seems like the only phone number she can remember is her grandmother's house. So according to the log in the police station uh, or the sheriff's station, she calls her grandmother four times. Um, there's some discrepancies because they've looked into the records and AT&T can't confirm that those calls actually went through. But if you look into this story, uh, her mom, Lutis uh, Sutton, uh, I hope I'm saying that right. Um, she actually does get the information from her grandmother that Mitrice has been arrested. So somehow she got in contact with her grandmother that night. Um, we know she was at least in contact with her grandmother back at the restaurant because they had called her grandmother to try to get her grandmother to cover the bill. But unfortunately, she would have needed a fax machine to do that. They weren't going to take the information just over the phone. I think her grandmother's in her 90s, didn't have a fax machine handy, so she really couldn't help out there. Um, but we now get back to the police station. Um, so yeah, Sutton is saying deputies indicated her daughter would be held overnight. So she elected to stay home with her younger daughter until the morning. Recordings of Sutton talking to police reveal she was concerned about her daughter's safety, in particular, that she wouldn't be released into the night alone. However, the police decided not to hold her for a psychological evaluation and decided to release her that night instead. Her mom literally said to these guys on the phone, you know, I don't want you to release her in the middle of the night. And then we see a news story the next morning about, you know, a girl missing or found with her head chopped off or something like that. And she's kind of laughing as she's saying to this and saying this to them. And they're saying, no, 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 she'll be safe. Don't, you know, you don't have to worry. Um, and her mom says, you know, it's, I think she says something like, it's kind of dangerous out here or things are pretty strange out here. Um, so the fact that they had that kind of communication coming from her mom, her mom, if she was, if she knew that Mitrice was going to be released that night, she would have uh, woken up her younger daughter and driven out the 40 or 50 miles, however far it was for her to come and pick her up. But she was under the assumption that that would have been a waste of time, that they weren't going to process her that quickly. Plus, you have this information coming in from the people at the restaurant saying she didn't seem to be in her right mind. Um, now, police or the sheriffs would later contradict that information. I've actually seen some copies of their reports, and they're trying to talk down uh, how odd she was. They're basically saying she just seemed like she was being normal, so we couldn't hold her. Well, look. You've got her on a charge of carrying uh, possession of marijuana, which admittedly in California, um, at that time at least, uh, was not an offense you would usually get jailed for. It's usually a ticket is written unless you have a significant amount. Um, they had alcohol in her car. Uh, we know that if they would have given her a breathalyzer, she at least had one drink at the restaurant. I don't, I don't think it would have been enough to kick her over the .08 limit, but it doesn't look like they even did that much. Um, they were hearing from people at the restaurant that she was acting extremely odd. Um, there were several employees at the restaurant that noted that. The intent of the manager was to make sure that she was safe because she was acting so odd. But for some reason, once the sheriffs start processing her, no, she's all completely normal. There's nothing we can do. We have to let her go. Oh, by the way, uh, she didn't pay her bill. 
which uh, is a charge that could actually wind up uh, landing her in jail. Let's take a look real quick at some research I did uh, just on that aspect of it. All right, so if we head over to bringmytreeshome.org, uh, which I think is a website that her father manages, um, they have a pretty good section of the facts here. And they're saying that she was arrested and booked for defrauding an innkeeper. Now, I looked that up and I got this result from Los Angeles Criminal Lawyer Pro. Um, this could actually result in a misdemeanor petty theft charge. Uh, on a petty theft convic conviction, the defendant can be sentenced to serve up to six months in jail, pay costly court fines, and compensate the victim for their losses. So I would assume on that level of charge, I mean, if it's something where you could wind up spending six months in jail, um, I think the sheriffs could have probably opted to hold her for at least the night. I really, after looking through this case, I don't have a good understanding of what was compelling them to release her in the middle of the night. It just seems very odd. And then to not take her to where her vehicle is. I mean, are you essentially just trying to shaft this person, releasing them at one o'clock in the middle of the night in a, an area where there's no buses running? The last buses apparently that run in that area happen at about 8 p.m. I'm pretty sure the sheriffs would be aware of that. There is no public transport that you could pick up from out there. Um, she had no money on her. She had her, uh, her ID was apparently in her car. Her purse was in her car. Her cell phone was in her car. What could she have done? How, how are you releasing her knowing that she's going to be safe when she has absolutely no options and uh, you know that her family isn't coming to get her? They've been in contact with her family. It's very, very, it's it just, I don't get it. I really don't get how this thing happened this way. So the next morning, um, her mom calls up uh, to see if she can come pick up my trees. Uh, they tell her that she's already been released and of course, her mom freaks out at that point and starts looking for her daughter. Um, they're saying that she had been released because she had no previous record and they didn't hold her for a 72 hour uh, psychological review um, because once again, the cops had laid all this information out about, no, she was just acting fine when they were interacting with her, despite the fact that you have you know, uh, many people before that saying that there was some issue going on with her there. So at this point, um, she is not seen. About an hour after her mom contacts the police, there seems to be a sighting of her. So uh, jumping over to this map real quick, which I wish I could give someone credit, but they didn't um, put their name in here, whoever put this together. Uh, but this is the, you can see Calabasas is right up here and Agora Hills is over here. Um, this is a map of kind of the important points of interest pertaining to this case. What we get here is, well, first of all, you can see Pepperdine University's here. This is the Pacific Coast Highway, the one. And this is where Joffrey's is. So they're calling this point A. From here, um, she is arrested. They travel all the way up through this incredibly windy canyon with very dangerous cliffs. Um, close to the 101 freeway, and this is where the Lost Hills Sheriff substation is uh, at point B. She then leaves, um, somehow comes back through a section of this canyon, and there is a sighting from a uh, Channel 5 KTLA in Los Angeles uh, had a newsman that used to work with them called Bill Smith, and he lives at, in this area. Essentially, he wakes up in the morning, he's looking in his backyard, and he sees what is assumed to be my trees. He describes her as a young black girl. Um, I believe he notes that she is wearing jeans and a black shirt and that she has Afro hair. Um, she is sitting on some steps in his backyard. He interacts with her a little bit. He asks if she's okay. She says she's just resting. And then she gets up and scuttles off back to a trail. Now his house kind of butts up against some open trails. Um, so it, it's strange cause I don't know if she is running into like wilderness type area after that, or if she is running further into a neighborhood because his home is right on the edge of kind of both. 
So, um, but there is a lot of people that look into this case. They seem to assume that he lives out in the middle of nowhere. Um, his house is kind of at the start of a whole neighborhood area where there are plenty of homes. I would assume that most of these homes have uh, outdoor plumbing or uh, at least hoses available. So if she was extremely thirsty, you know, I mean, she is at this point probably about six miles away from the sheriff station. Um, could she have gotten water out there? I think probably pretty easily, especially if she's, you know, just walking into people's backyards. So one theory that I see about this is that she is, um, you know, bound to succumb to the elements. I don't know why logically that would happen with where I'm seeing her path go. But ultimately, um, tragedy did strike, but they wouldn't find it out for almost 10 months after she disappeared. And that included some apparent false sightings of her in the Las Vegas area. One of those sightings by a former boyfriend of hers, which when you crack into the actual details of that, um, he was a boyfriend of hers, not even a boyfriend. They went to a school dance together uh, when he was 15. So he hadn't seen her in nine or 10 years. He's in Vegas at two o'clock in the morning, drunk, and thinks that he sees her and that he goes up to her. He says, my trees, and this girl goes running off and he's convinced it's her. Um, obviously it's not because her body is found on Monday, August 9th, 2010. And it's pretty interesting that the conditions that her body is found um, are that there was park rangers going to check on a spot that had been previously used as a marijuana grow site. Um, and they went to make sure that it wasn't being used again. And they found her remains there. Um, just really interesting to me that she would be found in a location like that. We're talking at that point, um, you know, it's, it's a type of criminal activity. Does that mean that she bumped into someone? Uh, I don't know. But that spot in particular to, for a body to be placed there really makes me think who had knowledge of that particular site. Apparently, it's very tough to hike to that location. Um, and she was found with her clothing removed. Several articles of her clothes are nearby. Uh, but let's get into more, some more detail about when she was found. Back to the article at the LAist.com. Uh, when Richardson's body was found, L.A. County Sheriff's detectives, against the recommendation of L.A. County Assistant Chief Coroner Ed Winter, airlifted the remains to the Lost Hills Station. This goes against a code that states that a body can't be disturbed or moved without permission from the coroner. The reports of how her body was found contradict the photos of the scene. And though Richardson's death was not investigated as a homicide, her mother believes she was killed. For one, Richardson's leg was found two yards away from her body with the femur removed, but there were no signs that animals had done it. It also seems unlikely that animals would have been able to remove Richardson's clothing, as authorities suggested. Animals would have had to unhook her bra and unbuckle her belt, then carry the clothing items to where they were found 500 to 600 feet away from the body. Some of her clothes were never found, and those that were found were never sent to a crime lab to be examined for evidence. Now, at this point, I think it's important for me to tell you that many people that look into this case think the sheriff's department is covering something up here. Uh, one of the theories that is kicked around is that uh, when she left, apparently there's some footage of her leaving the sheriff's station and within a few minutes, a car also leaves, a sheriff's car. Um, I don't know if there's anything to that because when we look at the order of events here, if uh, the Smith sighting is accurate, she wasn't with a sheriff at that point when she was in someone's backyard. Um, now, one theory that I think her father said is it's possible that when Smith called that in, um, that he asked for sheriffs to come and take a look. And at that point, did sheriffs meet back up with her and did something bad happen? Um, I'm not sure. This is all just, just theory that I'm putting out there. But very strange that um, they would essentially move the body without the coroner investigating the area. This means the coroner never had an opportunity to check the actual scene to see possibly what 
they could have found. I mean, they have a very specific view of these crime scenes. And for them to not be able to process that scene properly puts a very big question mark in terms of how this case is being handled by the this uh, sheriff's department. Um, from other information I've seen, the coroner actually showed up before this was this body was airlifted out. They were at least at the site, uh, not the actual scene, because it was difficult to get them there. Uh, apparently, some people were being dropped in through helicopters to actually get to the location where the body was found. But the coroner was held off from accessing the actual scene. So um, I don't know why that would happen. The sheriffs said they were worried that the body was going to be disturbed by animals if they left it there. That logic fails me a little bit because that body has already been out there for 10 months at this point. Apparently, uh, part of this body has been mummified. Uh, animals really don't bother uh, bodies that are in a mummified state. Um, and really, isn't there any other ways to section this off if you're worried about animals tampering with the scene? Isn't there some kind of... Uh, netting that could be put up or, you know, you place a couple officers down there for the night or something. I just, I don't see that that was the only option they had was to airlift her remains out as soon as they found them. But for some reason, uh, that's the option that they took. Jumping over to the dailynews.com, we get a little more information about the body. There were no obvious bullet wounds, no evidence of knife stabs or blunt force trauma. There was only her skeleton resting atop leaves and brush. About 100 feet away lay her dark bra, a pair of blue jeans, and a pink belt. Um, that means that there's a lot of items that haven't been found. I've also seen additional detail about um, her body when it was recovered and the hyoid bone, which is used in a lot of these investigations to see if someone has been strangled because typically there is a little section of that bone that will break if someone has been strangled. Um, her hyoid bone is missing. So it's very strange because you'll hear descriptions about this and they're saying that they recovered pretty much her whole body. Um, in one description, they were saying that they had essentially found her head and moved her head and that's how they knew where the rest of her body was, which how could they have done that if the neck bone between her head and her body was actually missing? I'm not sure. Um, and we get another very disturbing wrinkle in all this where her family actually hikes to the spot. They eventually figure out where the spot is um, after the police have processed it and, and removed everything. They go there to have a memorial they, um, they do that, and upon them sitting and spending time there, they find a bone. And it turns out to be a finger bone that does belong to my trees. So once again, this is just raising questions about how the sheriffs are processing this scene. Uh, the other question I have is about the missing clothes. So they find a bra, they find her uh, blue jeans, and they find her belt. Obviously, we're missing footwear. Um, her family keeps saying that her underwear is missing. I don't know if perhaps she would have gone without, but if nothing else, we're missing at least a, um, I think it's a Bob Marley t-shirt, if I remember right, a black shirt. And in some reports, I'm hearing that there was actually two shirts. There was a t-shirt and there was kind of a long sleeve shirt uh, that she might've been wearing, I believe under the t-shirt. Both of those items are missing. And when I hear that you've got uh, such a critical piece of evidence like the, you know, the hyoid bone missing. Um, I'm wondering, is it possible that, you know, if someone would have killed her by cutting her throat or something like that, would they have gotten rid of the bloodiest of the evidence, which is going to be the two shirts? Is that why the shirts aren't with the rest of the clothing? I know it's a morbid thought. I hate putting it out there like that, but it's just a thought that I can't get my head around. Um, and outside of that, just looking at where her body was found, uh, in the film, uh, it's called uh, Lost Compassion. 
In the film, they really go into some really good detail about how the body is found, and they have a uh, analyst that is basically just working for the family that's reviewing this information uh, and talking about how the body is found and how the clothing is found, and that assumptions being made by the police that, oh, that's a flash flood area, the clothing could have been removed by water, um, just really doesn't seem to hold up. First of all, taking jeans off um, for some people is uh, <laughs> its own trial in itself. But they have a very good specific point that the way her body is found, um, she has an arm that is bent up against her body kind of like this. So for her shirts to be taken off, um, they probably had to happen before she was dead or at least before she was in that position. Um, it, I, I guess it could have happened pretty soon after she was dead, but you're talking two layers of a shirt, some kind of undershirt, and then her bra after that. So what is the feasibility that that stuff came off post-mortem? Um, I kind of agree with the, with the analysts in the film. It's pretty low. And uh, once again, just leaves us with a bunch of questions and not very many answers. So what do the officials, the uh, sheriffs that are working this case, what do they think happened to her? We're going to jump to newsweek.com. Some law enforcement officials surmised that Richardson, who suffered from bipolar disorder, which by the way, I'm pretty sure is undiagnosed. She's not taking any medication. Um, she worked or at least interned for a psychologist and was talking to the psychologist about some issues that she was having. Her psychologist mentioned the possibility that she might have been dealing with bipolar disorder, but it seemed like they were very early on in any type of diagnosis about this. Um, but anyway, uh, they're saying that she walked into the canyon took off her own clothes and succumbed to anaphylactic shock from extensive poison oak exposure. You know, for anyone to be trekking through, I mean, these are severe conditions. We're talking really thick brush. Um, she wasn't anywhere near a path. She was literally just cutting through uh, growth. Why is she going to remove her clothes? I don't know. Um, unfortunately, because of the state the body is found in, I don't know that there's any information to really refute or support that. Uh, you know, obviously, if they would have found her before her body had been skeletonized, um, they could probably see in her skin if there was scrape marks. They could probably check her feet to see if it looked like she had been walking uh, through the terrain without her shoes for some reason. Um, very hard to understand this. Uh, theory, but I believe that they have to come to this type of theory, probably because of what they did find. They found her body uh, pretty much all in one location. They found, I think, almost all of her bones, and they probably didn't find that any of them had been broken, which meant she probably didn't have some kind of fall while she was hiking through this area and hurt herself. Um, I'm sure that they could have seen if there was any fractures in her skull or anything of that nature. We're not hearing any story like that at all. Um, this seems like a bit of a reach in terms of a story, I think, because of the type of state they found her body in. And uh, is it feasible? I suppose so. You know, I'm sure there is uh, poison oak out there. Um, I don't know. I don't know, guys. It's a really, really tough case. And quite honestly, um, no one seems to have the answer. We just have several people that are extremely critical of the sheriffs. Uh, her mother and father did wind up suing. They got a settlement from the sheriff's department of nine hundred thousand dollars, four hundred and fifty thousand dollars for each of them. They're not they're not married anymore. Um, but outside of that, let's take a look at current news that we can find on this. This is an article from November of 2016. Efforts to help solve Mitrice Richardson's death continue. Six years after Mitrice Richardson's remains were found in a rugged Malibu Canyon, dozens of people who want to raise awareness about her case plan to hand out information during an open house at the Malibu Lost Hills Sheriff's Station. The goal is to continue the dialogue and to remind the public that Richardson's case continues to remain open and, and unsolved, said Rhonda Hampton, the organizer of the event on Saturday, and a family friend who once mentored Richardson and who had been active in her investigation. 
Um, that is an understatement. Rhonda Hampton is extremely active. She works very hard, from what I can see, to keep this case in the public eye. Um, I saw an interview with her, I think that just uh, uh, happened last month. So know that she is working on this very, very hard. She's also the psychologist that Mitrice was interning with. So that's her connection to all of this. Uh, also, free copies of a documentary made about Richardson's case called Lost Compassion will be handed out. Um, I guess at this point I should tell you about it. Um, Lost Compassion, produced in 2016 by Chip Croft. Um, I was able to see it on Amazon. If you're an Amazon Prime member, you can watch it for free, essentially. And uh, I, I mean, for whatever you pay for being a, a Prime member uh, annually. Um, it is... I would say, if anything, it's edited a bit rough. Um, there's some problems just with uh, some of the shots are kind of shaky. Some of the sound and the volume kind of goes wacky here or there. But in terms of content, this thing is completely on point. It is a very good view of this case. Uh, there's a ton of information that it covers. Um, it's, it, I think it's definitely worth your time if you're going to look into this case more. It's almost two full hours of information specifically about this case. A lot of it focuses on the search before they realize that my trees has actually passed away, um, which I'm really trying not to go into in this video. So know that if you're looking for more details on that, uh, Lost Compassion is certainly a place to do it. And I love that they entered this into the Malibu Film Festival. This was literally screened um, just a few miles from where this happened. And in terms of trying to jog or move people to speak about this, if they know about this case, if they have some information that the authorities don't, I think that is a really good and smart move on the part of uh, the filmmakers and Chip Croft in particular. So um, I just, I really have to recommend it. If you're interested in this case, you have to watch this film. Uh, it's also available on other uh, digital channels. I, I think you can rent it as well. On top of the amazing work that Rhonda Hampton has done in terms of keeping this case in the public eye, speaking to press about it regularly, she also put together, I believe it was a 500 page document that she sent to the attorney general trying to get them to probe the sheriff's department to see if there was wrongdoing happening uh, in this particular case. Now, just as of, um, I think this article came out just, yeah, February of 2017, uh, we get the update on that effort. California Attorney's General investigation has failed to uncover evidence that would merit criminal charges against Los Angeles County Sheriff's deputies. Um, before I continue here, let me just say the sheriff's have gone through some significant issues around the same time uh, and, and quickly after this case. You've got um, essentially some people that are now sitting in jail. Uh, there's reports of many gangs being run within the jails that are managed by the sheriff's department. It's It could be a whole other brain scratch on its own, but just know if, that if you look into this case, you're probably going to bump into a lot of information about the head of the sheriff department, sheriff's department, who I believe uh, just last month uh, finally got his sentence, and the under sheriff that was working under him, and some very troubling things that they were doing, in particular with the jails that they were managing. But um, back to this particular case. There is insufficient evidence to support a criminal prosecution for destruction, alteration, or concealment of evidence. The letter to Richardson's father also noted that the statute of limitations for concealment or tampering of evidence had passed more than two years ago. Um, so... You know, it's ultimately not surprising, but it's always a little heartbreaking for me when you see that um, sometimes it seems like the powers that be are protecting their own interests and protecting the interests of people under them. And it seems like this is another case where that might be occurring, but um, very tough. And finally, I did find one other kind of unique aspect to all of this. Um, if we take a look at PasadenaWeekly.com, 
Her skeletal remains were located in August, less than 10 miles from the sheriff's station on a pot farm adjacent to porn photographer Suze Randall's, or I guess that's Susie, Susie Randall's property, where screams were reportedly heard four days after Maitrice disappeared, according to a story based on reports by area residents to homicide detectives that appeared in the Malibu Surfside News. Um, What's odd about this to me is uh, apparently the path that they were taking to get to where her remains were located was not the easiest path. According to an interview that I heard with Rhonda, she was saying that if you were allowed to go on Miss Randall's property, there is a much easier path to get to where those remains are located. Um, it just there's something about this. I'm not saying that people that are involved in the porn industry are necessarily criminals. Um, I'm just saying it's very weird to me that this is a location for a marijuana farm that was busted, and that could mean that it's someone that knew about it as a as a farming location that knew that it was very hard to get to, if especially if you didn't have the permission of uh, Susie or Sue yeah Susie Randall uh, or it could have been someone working for law enforcement that knew about that location and that it was extremely hard to get to. Um, it just, it really bothers me, uh, the location that she's found. Uh, this is a quote from former Sheriff Lee Baca. Officers have made errors in terms of what they thought their roles were. We need to revamp the department. And boy, is that happening uh, with him, I think literally right now sitting in prison. Um, but it is a very interesting point. There was enough at the site of Joffrey's for them to be concerned about her emotional state. Why that was changed by officers after the fact, once she got back to um, their station, is beyond me. Uh, I, I think Rhonda makes a very good point where she, where she says, why didn't they hold her until they could have taken her to people that could have properly diagnosed and analyzed her state of mind? Why did the sheriffs get to make that call? Shouldn't they have just put her on a psychiatric hold and stuck to that? It's a really good question. And then outside of that, you get the question of how do they let her go in in the middle of the night knowing she has absolutely no means of transportation, communication, and a 13-mile uh, jagged and twisty road with no walking path to get back to her vehicle. I don't know. Releasing people from police custody after midnight without necessary resources puts them at risk, especially those who might be having a mental breakdown. It seems inhumane, said Shirley Spencer of the Friends Group of Pasadena, which has been calling for reform of the sheriff's nighttime release policy. And boy, do I think that that is a very good idea. Um, there are tons of links that I'm going to have in the description box below. I'm going to have a link to the Facebook page, which is managed uh, by Rhonda. So it's updated. Literally, I'm looking at it right now. It was updated seven hours ago. Um, Justice for Mitrice Richardson. Uh, I'm going to have a link to the IMD profile. Uh, sorry, IMDB profile for the film Lost Compassion. I really hope if you're interested in this case that you will give that a look. Um, I'm also going to have a link to an interview with Rhonda Hampton um, done by a man named Ed Opperman. It's on YouTube. It is almost two hours long, and there is a ton of great information that Rhonda uh, goes through on that, as well as the usual Web Sleuths link and a few Reddit links um, plenty to go into if you're interested into looking into this case. What do I think happened here? Um, the question of was she struggling or not is pretty much answered. I think everyone is on the same page about that. Everyone thinks that she is struggling with some type of mental disorder at this point. That's really not in question. Uh, the, how the sheriffs handle her and handle all of that is highly in question. I think that's one whole avenue uh, that you can go down on its own. Did they do the right thing? Do they have the right policies? Do they have the right training to handle situations like this? No one expects them to be psychologists and psychiatrists, but we do expect them to know when they should hand off something to experts to be f evaluated further. And did that really happen here? I don't know. 
what it seems like is my trees did unfortunately take that right turn, went into Malibu Canyon, um, wound up in the backyard of this former KTLA reporter, uh, which quite honestly, we don't have very, we have somewhat solid confirmation that it's her, but it's not perfect. We don't have footage of her where they can say, hey, look, you know, my, my house has cameras. Here's the picture. We showed it to her parents. They said that's definitely her. We don't have a 100% solid sighting of her even at that spot. It seems like it's a pretty good piece of information. He described her clothing. He described uh, her body type. He described her hair. But it's not impossible that it was someone else. It could be um, that she was somewhere entirely different. We, we really have no idea. If, and if that's true, then the case of there being maybe some you know crooked person in the sheriff's department that's responsible for all this becomes a lot more feasible to me. Uh, if that sighting is accurate, it seems to me that she did somehow walk into this very tough area to get to um, or went somewhere else, was found by someone that took advantage of the situation. That's the hardest thing about this case. It is not likely that if someone did something to her, that this is someone that actually knew her. This probably would have been a crime of opportunity. And you're talking Thursday morning, 5, 6, 7 a.m., um, 7, maybe 8 a.m. at the latest. I mean, she's essentially found uh, just over a mile, uh, at least as the crow flies, from that sighting. That's not a whole lot of time. Most people can walk a mile in about 20 minutes, maybe 25 minutes if, if you're really taking your time. Uh, admittedly, where she was found, I don't think it was a straight line. I think she was probably taking paths or roads that are quite windy. Could have been a couple miles, but I would imagine within an hour, if she went directly from that siding to where she was ultimately found, whatever happened to her happened to her within an hour, two hours tops. And that's really the question. Um, if you are dealing with poison oak, um, I, I, don't, I just don't know enough about it. Are you able to take on enough of that to where your body will go into shock before you're even being irritated by the fact that you're hitting poison oak all over the place? Wouldn't you feel it the first couple times? I just, I don't know enough about it. Um, it's really hard, but uh, th there is a family that cares about her. There are friends that care about her. And there are many lingering questions that I truly hope someday will be answered. And this is where I turn it over to you. Let's talk about this in the comments below. I ask we please be respectful. Um, you never know who's going to come and look at these comments. If you wouldn't say it in front of her family, I would say, um, you know, don't say it in the comments below. The, these are real people dealing with real tragedy. And I just hope that someone out there has some information that can crack this case. And ultimately, I think that's what it's going to take is um, someone that is in the know is going to have to step forward. And if you are that person, I've got the contact information in the description box below. You could help put this family at ease um, if you would share that with them. I really, really hope that you are a good enough person to do that if you have that info. All right, guys. Thank you so much for spending some time with me here on Brain Scratch today. I appreciate each and every one of you out there. I hope you have a wonderful weekend. I'll see you here back on Monday on the Lord March channel.